I'm sitting here today with nothing in front of me on the desk because this is a very different video to my usual ones. And that's because I'm going to share with you today the experiences that I had, and actually we had, I should say, at a recent blind listing event that I organized. There are many people on the internet whose first response to any kind of review, like the ones that I put on my channel, their first response is usually, did you do a blind test? And my answer is always no. One of the reasons for that is that I'm a one-man band, I've got to do these things on my own, and it's very hard to set up a proper blind test for yourself when you're the one making the connections. Now I know there's tools out there that can help you to do switching between things blind so you don't know which input you're listening to, but short of investing in those things which I can't afford to do at the size the channel currently is, short of that it's very difficult to do a proper blind test on your own. The other reason I don't do blind tests is that I think they've got some flaws, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end once I share some details about what we did in the blind listening test and what the data looked like. But suffice to say, I think blind listening can have its place, but I don't think it's the perfect be-all and end-all solution that it's often presented to be. Before we jump into the details of this event, I want to say a huge thanks to Jeff from Hey Now Hi-Fi here in Melbourne who hosted us for the event. This was entirely out of the goodness of his heart that he made his showroom available to us and a lot of his gear as well. And so I want to say a huge thanks again to Jeff for making this possible. And I also want to thank the nine people that attended and the few others that booked tickets and then for whatever reason couldn't make it on the day. Thank you for all agreeing to take part. And for those of you that turned up, thank you for also coming along and sharing your experiences, your thoughts and your feedback with me to help make this a really enjoyable experience and also a great learning experience too. To give you an idea of how all this was set up, we were using a speaker set up for this blind listening test, we'll talk about that more a bit later, and to make that work we tried to keep the seating options as narrow as possible to keep people as close as possible to the sweet spots for the speakers, and that meant we had five rows of three chairs per row. With the nine people that turned up, that meant that we had people sort of spread out across the rows, there was a bit more space than we'd planned for and that was actually a good thing. But it also did bring in some challenges still because having multiple people sitting in different locations means they did have slightly different experiences. Before I explain what that meant from a data point of view, the other things I should talk you through is the gear we were using. For most of the testing we were running an ISO acoustics power conditioner, specifically that was the Aquarius V5, and then that was feeding various other devices. So if I work my way through the source chain, we had a Lumen T3 streamer, that was feeding out via USB to a Cord M scaler into a TT2. From the TT2 we were taking a DAC line output, so not volume controlled, straight from the TT2 into an SPL Director SE preamp, and then that was feeding the SPL Performer power amplifier. Actually, that's the Performer 1200, I should say, in case there's multiple models. And then the power amp was connected up to a set of Kudos Titan 606 speakers, which, by the way, were nothing short of wonderful. I think pretty much everybody there on the day commented on just how great their speakers were. Now, I'm not going to get them in for a full review because I don't have space for a full set of floor-standing speakers here. But the Titan 606 from Kudos are nothing short of wonderful based on our experiences on the day. So check them out. Go have an audition if you're somewhere that you can. Connecting up all these devices, we had a hodgepodge of different power cables, so I'm not going to try to name those. But we were definitely using some consistent interconnects and speaker cables for the most part. And that was the Wirewall Eclipse 8 RCA, XLR and speaker cables. And so that was kind of our base setup. What we then looked to do was rotate in and out different things. Of course, it was all blind. The participants didn't know what was being done when. But we worked our way through things like speaker cables. We tried some different DACs. So having the TT2 without the M scaler as one option and a topping E50 as the other option. We had the power conditioner in the circuit and out of the circuit. There was a control round, of course. We tried upsampling from the M scaler and no upsampling from the M scaler. There were lots of different tests we did. And now one more thing I'm going to tell you before I talk about the data itself is how we approached the actual testing. In order to keep this blind, the way it was set up was that participants would sit down. Everything was kind of shrouded behind a cloth other than the speakers, of course. And so our participants would sit down. They would hear a setup one or setup A. They'd then go into a separate room in Jeff's showroom where they were away. They couldn't see or really hear what was going on. I would then make the changes or not make changes if it was a control round bring them back in, they'd listen again, and they answered on a survey whether they thought there was a difference or no difference between A and B. Once that was done, we then did a second round where I didn't get people to leave the room, I just made the changes behind the scenes. In the case of the control round, I just made noises as if I was changing things so they didn't know if there was a control or not a control. And that meant the participants could answer a bit more rapidly because we didn't lose time moving between rooms. There was still a delay between sample A and sample B, but it was a little bit reduced. 
And then what I did in that second round of testing was ask some more subjective questions as to what people felt was the difference. If there was one, they could say, no, there was no difference. But if they felt there was a difference, what they were hearing between setup A and setup B and which they preferred. And so the idea was to start off by getting a really clear answer of, is there a difference or is there not a difference? And then in the second round of testing, once we had a very definitive, is there or isn't there a difference, that's when we got into the subjective answers about why people preferred it, what they liked better, all those sorts of things. And so the idea was to try to get some qualitative data, but also get some really clear, absolutely unbiased, blind answers of yes or no, there is or isn't a difference. That was the idea. Unfortunately, it kind of all went wrong. And so I'm not even going to take you through the data because it's absolutely unusable. And that's not a knock on the people that came to the event. It's also not really a knock on the setup of the event, because I think in terms of trying to create a proper blind setup, it's about as clean as we could have gotten it in the way that we tried to approach it. And I'll talk about some of the improvements I've got planned for next time when we get to the end of this. But the key things that went wrong here is that when we got to the control, almost everybody heard a difference in the control. And just in case you're not familiar with the control term, that means there was nothing changed. It was the same system in round A with round B, but people thought it was different. And by the way, nobody saw any of the data until we finished all the testing and came back and did a data review. When we did though, what we all saw was that the data really doesn't tell much of a story. I did also go through the data to see if maybe where people sat, whether the row or whether they're in the center or off to the side, if those things made a difference. And it hasn't really seemed to impact the data. Experientially, when I went and sat in one of the side seats, it made it very, very difficult for the blind testing. Because what I found when I sat in one of the, I think it was the second row off to the side, was that I had a direct line of sight to one of the speakers, but not the other. And that meant that a lot of the treble information, a lot of the high frequency cues were just missing because someone's head was blocking them. So what that told us was that the speaker setup probably wasn't ideal for blind listening. And that probably provides me with a nice segue into what this taught me and what this taught all of us because we had a long chat about this at the end. And thank you to everyone again for sharing your thoughts, your experiences, etc. And what this showed us is there's multiple things that we need to think about if you or I or anyone is going to set up blind testing. And there's a few things to go through here, so let me step through them one by one. And let me make it really clear here that this is not about making excuses. This is about finding a way that we can clearly get some good data where people are able to properly answer the control question and show that they're not hearing things that aren't there, whilst also being able to hear differences when there are differences to be heard. What we saw from this set of data, and I'm happy to share it in a link down below, what we saw when we reviewed this data was that it was just all over the place. And that's for a number of reasons that I want to step through now. And first and foremost, I think one of the key challenges that we had was that when people had to get up, leave their seats, go out to another room, then come back in, settle down again and listen to round B or set up B, that was too long between test samples. But on the other hand, if I'd tried to do the changes while they were sitting in the room and do it quickly, it was going to be really obvious and therefore bias their results when they heard me doing things and therefore assumed something was different. But that's where blind listening starts to create problems. We often think blind listening is this pure, unbiased approach where it suddenly removes all possible variables except the actual system, but it's completely not the case. And that's because our brains are tricky. So on one hand, if you're doing a sighted test where you know something's changing, that can bias you if you have expectations that you're going to hear something different and or if you think one product should be better or sound a certain way compared to the other. On the other hand, if you're doing a blind test, your brain kind of goes into a different mode where it goes hunting for differences. And what I find is that that actually makes us work harder, trying to find things, trying to listen into the music. We start to notice things on setup B that we didn't notice on setup A, but it's really just because we're looking for things. We're listening differently to what we would do if we just sat back, we knew something was different, and we were just taking it in. Now, I'm not sitting here saying either approach is right. My point is both have their own issues. Both bring variables and biases. They're just different sorts. Another thing that caused problems was the fact that we use speakers and therefore the position that somebody sat in and whether or not you're in the absolute sweet spot makes a huge difference to your experience. As I said before, if you were sitting behind somebody and you didn't have an equivalent line of sight to both speakers, you weren't going to get some of the spatial cues that rely on you getting the same high frequency information from both the left and right channels. Along with that, there's timbral or tonal information that's carried in the treble. And so all of that could have been completely missing depending on where you sat. Another thing that made it hard was that I wanted to give people plenty of time to hear each track. 
but that meant that what you're often hearing was a minute of the track starting from the beginning or your intro into a verse. And then for the second round, what you were then comparing was the last thing you'd heard was the verse, and then the first thing you heard on setup B was the introduction. Now that introduction might have had completely different tonality, a completely different sort of feel to it, and that could also skew the responses. Ideally, you'd be set up in a way that you were switching quickly between setup A and setup B, and that would then allow you to have very, very short blocks of music where you're listening to the same exact phrase or couple of phrases, maybe a whole verse, whatever it is, but your segments of music would be identical and very quickly compared. Once again, by going down the blind listening path and trying to force a situation where no one knew what was going on, what we did instead was we compromised the ability to listen and switch between tracks, or switch between, sorry, switch between systems and listen to the same part of the track. And so what we all took away from this is that blind listening tests actually have their own problems. One of the things we did because we had some extra time at the end was we revisited the test between the topping E50 and the chord TT2. Now for this test, we removed the chord M scalar, so it was just DAC versus DAC. And in the data from the blind listening test, there was a mixed bag of those that thought they could hear a difference, those that thought they couldn't. I did notice on this one that the subjective responses were fairly consistent with this one. What people found was that the TT2 was more resolving and a bit more kind of forward with the sound, it had a bit more energy to it. And that's because you do get more information in terms of the tonal qualities, more space, you get a bit more textual information. And that meant that some people found the E50 to be more relaxing and enjoyable because the sound's a bit thicker and a bit warmer, whilst others like the T2-2 for its sense of space and that sense of detail. I'm not sitting here saying one is better or worse than the other. My point is that some people could hear a difference, but not everybody could hear a difference when we did the blind listening and there was the time between tracks. At the end, what we did was we gave up on trying to do it blind, and so everyone knew we were comparing the E50 and the TT2. People came into this sighted test with some expectations because they'd already seen the data, they knew what they'd thought of it the first time around, and so we came in knowing that this was going to be a polluted test. But we also came in, interestingly enough, with mixed biases. Not everybody came in thinking the TT2 was necessarily better, and so in some ways it kind of balanced itself out, where some people didn't expect to hear anything better from the TT2, maybe they thought it would be different, but not better, everybody had different thoughts, some expected the TT2 to be better, it was a really mixed bag. And so by doing it sighted in this final round, what we were able to do was very quickly shift between the E50 and the TT2, but also talk about what we were hearing. And it was very quickly evident to I think every single person in the room what the TT2 was doing that sounded different. I think by the end of it, everybody was hearing clear and obvious differences from the TT2 and the E50. Whether or not people preferred it, that's a different story. We had mixed opinions in the room, and that's totally fine. Some preferred the sort of slightly thicker, less kind of detailed and textured sound that the E50 delivered, whilst others loved the space and the clarity that the TT2 provided. But the key thing here, and the thing that really stood out to me, was the fact that by doing it sighted, by being able to swap quickly between the devices, what we were able to do was identify if there were differences and what the differences were, without even worrying about which one was better or worse. It wasn't about that, it was a question of did it make a difference? And the resounding response from everybody in the room was that it absolutely did, but that didn't come out when we did it blind. And so where all this leaves us is that if you're doing any kind of testing for yourself, Maybe mix in a combination of blind and not blind testing. Give yourself a chance to listen to things blind, form some expectations, but then also do it sighted, take the pressure off trying to hear differences, look for differences without maybe knowing what's there, and instead just plug something in, listen to it for a while, switch over, listen to that for a while, and then do some quick switching as well. Because every single approach reveals new and different things about what you're listening to. Taking that a step further, what that means for me, for the channel, and for what I'm going to share with you in the future... I do intend to run another event like this. By all reports, those that attended are excited to try it again and do it a bit differently. And so what we're going to do differently next time is we're probably going to do headphone setups instead, partly because this is largely still a headphone-based channel, although there's more and more speaker content coming. But we're going to use headphones because it's an area that I know viewers are interested in and also because it controls very specifically for each person. There's no issues with the room affecting the sound or the position that you're sitting in affecting the sound. Every time you put on a pair of headphones, you're going to get basically the same result. The other thing I'm going to look into is getting a quick and rapid but also blind switching system. 
so people will be able to quickly switch between two different systems and we won't have to take that time to move in and out of the room. I think that's going to make probably the biggest difference of everything, so I look forward to finding a way to do that one. And if anyone watching this has a good way to do it, that's going to be very sonically transparent because that's very important. If you've got a way to do that, then do reach out to me if there's any way you can help. I'm considering getting something like the Manly Skipjack, but they're quite expensive. I don't know if the channel can afford that yet. We'll see. And then the other thing I might bring into play is actually multiple rounds with the same devices without people knowing. One of the challenges we had here was to get through six different rounds. We only tried each round once. So we tried power conditioning once. We tried DAX once. We tried speaker cables once. It would be kind of fun to have people come back in not knowing that they were listening to the same thing again and see if the responses match. Obviously, there'll still be controls in place where we don't have any changes at all. In other words, A and B are identical systems. We'll do all those things. But they're just some of the changes and improvements that I hope to bring into place next time. And then the final learning that we took away from this was that there might be an opportunity to do some actual classes on critical listening skills. How do you listen for differences between different devices, different music, different sources, whatever it might be? What are the things you should be listening to, having some practice, being able to talk it through? So do make sure you subscribe and ring the notification bell if you want more content around things like blind listening and also critical listening skills. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet. This is more just a teaser as I form some thoughts in my head, but I think there could be something exciting to follow. But for now, I'm going to wrap things up here. I hope this video has been useful and interesting for you. I know it's not what you probably expected when you came into this video. It's definitely not what I expected when I started off down the blind listening event path, but hopefully it's still been informative and interesting for you. As always, if it was, I'd love it if you hit the like button, and please subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Music